You're listening to episode 177 of the Writing Life podcast from the National Centre for Writing, a weekly podcast for anyone who writes. I'm Simon Jones. Happy New Year. This is the first podcast of 2022, given that it is the 10th of January here in Norwich as I'm recording this. So on the show today, we have a great translation double bill with a conversation between Archana Mardavan and Sawad Hussain. Sawad was a virtual translator in residence in 2021 during our Visible Communities project, and this interview was arranged as part of that residency. Sawad is an Arabic translator with a focus on bringing narratives from the African continent out to wider audiences. She has contributed to journals such as Arab Lit and Asymptote. She was co-editor of the Arabic-English portion of the Oxford Arabic Dictionary, and recent translations include Passage to the Plaza by Sahara Khalife and A Bed for the King's Daughter by Sharla Ujjali. Archana is an Indian-American translator from Korean into English. She started teaching herself Korean 10 years ago and has now worked on many projects, including The Man Who Became a Flamingo by Oh Han Ki, contract work with Lesin Entertainment on genre webtoons, and Glory Hole by Kim Hyun, co-translated with Soyeon J. An, which is coming from Seagull Books in May 2022. She has contributed to Chogwa and is a staff translator for the Hanok Review. And I apologise to any of those writers and translators for any mangling of name pronunciations. There's a ton of fascinating material in this interview, and I was particularly interested myself in the webtoon stuff. Online serial comics isn't something we've covered on the pod before. Okay, so I will now hand over to Swad to introduce the conversation. Hi, Archana. Thank you so much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure to have you here. And I'm really excited uh, to talk to you. And just to let everybody know, you know, I don't know you personally. So this conversation is very much me getting to know you and about your practice as a translator. And that we first got to, you know, know each other a little bit through the BIPOC caucus, which has been uh, organized Mm -hmm. by Alta. Um, So I'm speaking to you from Cambridge, UK. And where are you today? Yeah, I'm in Dallas, Texas, um, visiting my parents who live here, but uh, usually I'm based in San Jose, California. So uh, it, it's a pleasure to, to meet you. And I, I've seen you on Twitter and, and <laughs> seen you in the in the caucus uh, Slack. And so it's, it's really awesome to kind of uh, see you and uh, chat with you. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So I'm really interested in how you got into working with Korean. And Mm -hmm. in addition to that, do you speak any other languages? Yeah, yeah. Um, So uh, I get this question a lot, especially, you know, they see an Indian American. (laughs) I mean, like you said it, right? Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. um, I mean, I grew up multilingual. I always had an interest in learning foreign languages. And I would say that the the thing that always attracted me to a language was the sound of it, um, mm-hmm. and that's really how it happened with uh, with Korean. Um, so the funny thing is, I watched this very campy Korean horror movie um, when I was in college, and um, amid all the screams and gore, um, I just fell in love with the way that Korean sounds as a language. Wow. And yeah, and that was really how it started. Um, and I think I was just casually listening to a podcast um, on teaching uh, people Korean. Um, this mm-hmm. was back, you know, a little over 10 years ago, when um, I think that the Korean media wave was just starting to kind of come to North America. Uh-huh. Um, so there weren't a lot of resources, but I found this podcast and I was like, oh, this is cool. And I just started sort of listening to it. And um, I think what what really made Korean stick over all of the other languages I I'd tried, and I tried like Italian and, and Brazilian Portuguese and wow. um, you know a whole bunch of other languages and I think what really stuck was just how phonetically and, and morphologically um, Korean was similar to my mother tongue which is um, Marathi um, which is wow, a language I would have never yeah. expected the relationship <laughs> between that oh, oh my goodness no you must tell me more yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because like I, they're, they're not linguistically very related, but there's a lot of um, you know similarities and kind of phonetics and 
some some grammar that's kind of you know just struck me as oh like I found myself thinking more in Marathi than I did in English when I was learning Korean wow. so yeah yeah and and so I think that's really how um I got into it and that, and that's what made it stick and now it's been you know a little over 10 years and um you know, I'm at this level of fluency I never thought I would ever attain in another language. So yeah, <laughs> yeah it's been great. So, so from what you were saying, was it initially you were self-taught and then did you like go for some study abroad courses or was it like online? Yeah, I was self-taught for almost uh, five years. And wow. then I, yeah, and then when I moved to the Bay Area, um, I found a, a, an adult language learning school and um, enrolled in advanced classes there. And I'm still with that instructor now. And now we we talk about, um, we're, we're sort of beyond grammar points, but we talk, we read a lot of academic papers. Um, uh-huh. She's she's actually an academic. She studied phonetics. So we, we read a lot of like sort of linguistics papers and, and um, wow. history papers and things like that. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been really great to kind of up level my language like that. Yeah, no, I'm just always really impressed because like by profession, I'm a teacher. I, I, I've been, I used to teach Arabic for about 10 years mm-hmm. and then, you know, moved into working in the ed- education sector and doing translation on the side. But I'm always really impressed with people who teach themselves languages, especially languages with different scripts to their like, you know, Mm -hmm. home language. So yeah, hats Mm -hmm. off to you. Um, (laughs) Have you ever (laughs) thought about going to Korea or have you managed to get over there? Yeah, I've been there only twice. Um, I went the first time, I think I was like, it was four years into learning the language I went there. Um, And, you know, that was such an interesting experience because again, like, I think the number of people who were learning Korean who were not Korean at the time was very, very limited. And um, so to see a brown person in Seoul, like speaking (laughs) Korean was just mind blowing to a lot of people. I went again in 2019. Um, that was my sort of like 30th birthday present to myself. <laughs> I just oh, did wow. a little solo trip. Yeah. Um, and that. that was very interesting because the reaction I got then was people asking, do you work in Seoul? Um, oh. And so, you know, it just kind of gave me this interesting little indicator of like the kind of globalization, I guess, that had happened or, or mm-hmm. like there were a lot more non-Korean people learning Korean and working there and living there. And, and I didn't get so many like wide eyes when I spoke in Korean. <laughs> in, yeah. In Korean. Also, maybe it's so. because like your level of fluency is, you know, mm-hmm. much higher. And that's why they just assume that you live there. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay. And so getting into translation, (laughs) so what Mm -hmm. sort of, you know, I know that you translate webtoons, but in like you've translated webtoons, but maybe you can just give me like a broad overview Mm -hmm. of, you know, maybe your first like translation projects or what excites you about translating, you know, basically whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I can tell you um, because, you know, it's interesting. I've been a a language learner and student of Korean for far longer than I have been a translator Um, Mm -hmm. (laughs) to the point that, you know, I see the emerging translators thing and I'm like, well, if if these people are emerging, I haven't even been conceived yet. (laughs) 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 Um, I started translating um, in earnest in 2019. So still very new. Um, But I think what was uh, what might be interesting to to talk about a little bit is, um, you know, I was very ignorant about translation for a long time. Um, Mm -hmm. And and it's kind of funny because I love to write. Um, I've actually published personal essays and I write fiction. Oh, um, okay, I didn't know yeah. that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, I love language. So you'd think I'd put two and two together and, and be like, oh, this is a sort of natural, um, tr- you know, trying to attempt translation as natural. But I yeah. got really kind of snooty when I got to a level of, of um, fluency in Korean where I'm like, well, now I don't need to read translation. I can just read mm-hmm. the original right. work. Um, and I became one of those people that nitpicked um, you know, translations, and I had this, like, misplaced sense of superiority, like, oh, they don't, like, they mistranslated that, <laughs> and, 
Um, you know, all of that really changed when I read Deborah Smith's essay in uh, the LA Review of Books that was like, yeah. around the time the vegetarian um, won the Booker Prize. Yes. And yeah, and she wrote about um, how translation is is recognizing, um, you know, not just it's not just words and it's not just transference, but it's kind of translating from one literary convention to another. Mm. And, um, and I just thought that was so fascinating to me because I had, I had thought about translation as just transference up until that point. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, and then I was like, wow, I'm extremely ignorant in this. And so I took um, Elisa Wukalmino's six week introduction to writing and translation workshop with catapult, which was the only catapult workshop available um related to translation at the time in 2019 Uh, right Mm -hmm. and then um i started to read more about translators you know more translators notes uh, more about i read started reading more korean and translation and followed more translation on social translators on social media and um you know and then i started to realize that translation is just this like perfect marriage of two things i really love like writing and and reading um as well as uh, language so that was really how i kind of got into it and i started seeking opportunities that you know were where people were interested in in giving out a a newbie translator a try Mm -hmm. um and my first kind of major project was with Nebulera Korea, which is a um, contemporary literary fiction uh, web um, magazine. Um, and they were looking, they had an open call for translators. Okay. Um, yeah. And I, and I worked on a, um, on a short novella that was serialized on the website, still on there. Um, oh, wow. It, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So that was my first, first ever project um, that got published at the beginning of 2020. Yeah, mm-hmm. <clears throat> like January 2020. So, yeah, that was uh, that was the first kind of foray into that, and then and then it was webtoons. I around that time I also got into translating webtoons, and and you know I was just trying to really read a lot of literature, um, translated literature, and also just Korean literature to see like what that space was like during that time because I was very fascinated with literary translation. So. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, for our listeners, I mean, because I personally, when we first started chatting on the mm-hmm. BIPOC like Slack channel, I didn't know what Webtoons were and I had to Google it. Uh-huh. So maybe you can just tell me and our listeners, like, what are Webtoons and what is your, you know, experience of translating? Like, what are some of the challenges maybe that you faced when Absolutely. translating Webtoons as opposed to doing, and I want to talk about your novella in a bit, but. Yeah, let's do webtoons first. Webtoons are, are super fascinating. Um, they are digital first comics. Um, they originated in South Korea, I believe, in the early two thousands. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and I think it it you know there's this tradition of um, you know manhwa and manga in mm-hmm. Japan, the kind of like physical comics. And the thing that makes webtoons unique is that it's web first uh, or mobile first um and it's kind of in this uh, you can read it scrolling on your phone Mm -hmm. um and so uh there's now a whole bunch of publishers of webtoons including legion which is where i did my work um the the platform that most people are probably familiar with uh is neighbor webtoon so and it's a little it's a little confusing because there's webtoon the 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 media the like the 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 type of content and then right. there's webtoon with the capital w which is the name of the publisher oh um, okay okay yeah okay. it's very okay. confusing yeah um so neighbor webtoon as it's known in korea and then webtoon as it's known in, in english speaking world um is like actually a publisher of webtoons Tunes. Okay. um yeah yeah um, but yeah, the na- neighbor webtoon is, uh, I would say, probably um, one of the more widely known um, publishers of webtoons. Is that sorry? Is um, that neighbor or neighbor? Yeah, yeah. N A V E R. Neighbor. Okay, interesting. Yeah, they're kind of like the they were they're like kind of a web portal um, media big media conglomerate. Um, you know, I, I sort of similar to Google, just like you know, has their hands in in a lot of different kind of media and tech spaces. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, yeah, so um, let's see, uh, what else is there? Uh, I, I guess, so in terms of uh, popularity, um, they're extremely popular in South Korea. And I think what's interesting is um, there's a number of uh, like Korean dramas that are mm -hmm. um, also uh, like Korean TV shows that are based off of uh, popular webtoons. So there's oh. one that's yeah, yeah, it's very, it's it's uh, super interesting, um, and I think that uh, there's actually one that's airing in Netflix right now. Uh, it's called Nevertheless. That's a that's pretty popular among like, I would say like you know the mid twenties or, or early twenties demographic, and that was based off of a webtoon that I had read. And um, oh. I, yeah, I I was all, I was always I always get a little a little thrilled when I'm like, oh, I read that webtoon. Now they're making a drama out of it. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Which is like a really good point that it's not just for like teenagers. There's also, I mean, it, it everybody is read. Is it do kids also read it or is it like teenagers and yeah. above? Yeah, I would say that there are uh, I, I would say kids also read it. Um it's just like movies like where there are a whole bunch of genres, there's a whole bunch of like age um kind of ranges. Oh, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, so there are webtoons that are for 12 and above, there are webtoons that are like for 15 years of age and above, and then there's kind of like the not safe for work, like 19 plus type of um, wow. <laughs> uh, webtoons. Yeah, that are, that are, um, yeah, on the, on the more provocative side, I guess. Like racy, um, yeah. For adults, yes, very racy, yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely there's a huge, there's a wide demographic of, of people that enjoy webtoons. Um, and they're also gaining a lot of, uh, it's also gaining a lot of traction in the English speaking world. Um, mm -hmm. and so like webtoon, the, the company, the publisher, the neighbor webtoon publisher, they actually have, um, an English platform where you, if you're, if you're a creator, you can publish, uh, your own webtoon on their on their platform oh okay for yeah for readers to consume and there are also some um english original webtoons uh that are quite popular like i'm reading laura olympus which is a, a retelling of hades and persephone and that's wow. an english original webtoon that's award-winning it like has i think probably one of the highest views on that website so okay and yeah, are, yeah. do you have to pay to access webtoons or are they like free or is it depending on the platform? Yeah, the monetization depends on the platform. Um, typically, uh, you can pay per episode. Um, and it's usually you have to buy like coins. So you, you use money to buy coins and then you expend coins to unlock episodes or chapters. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, and... Uh, and I think that there's, there's sort of like, uh, like you can pay to see, uh, so, so some webtoons are free, but you have to, you can pay to unlock like the future chapters, future chapters. sooner. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so Laura Olympus, for example, is one where, uh, there's a new chapter that unlocks every week. Okay. Um, but, but for paying for, for paying readers, uh, they're like five chapters ahead, uh, I think. So like, okay. yeah, so so it's pretty, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting, the monetization. So that leads me to a question about when you were translating Webtoons. Does that mean you've actually <clears throat> you've mm -hmm. translated everything beforehand if there's readers like working at different, you know, sort of paces? And also, if you can talk to me a bit about localizing the, the content, because um, we, we had a quick mm -hmm. chat about this, about maybe some of the decisions you were faced with when, when you know translating Korean content for I don't know if you're doing it for a UK audience or a US audience or yeah yeah um so it's I'm trying to I'm trying to think um I think it varies by comic there's definitely the translators are ahead for sure when it comes to what the readers are consuming it's never we're several weeks in advance we have we've like translated okay. in advance um uh I think with Legion there was um, maybe eight to ten episodes had been translated before it was even available for English readers to to consume. So I had to to publish a or I had to submit a certain number of translations before I think eight to ten chapter translations wow. before um, it it started. Yeah, it started 
uh, being published on the website. Um, and but uh, but often the comics were still ongoing, so um, that added like a interesting challenge at times where. Um, I remember once there was a character whose gender was not um, clear mm -hmm. um, and it, you know, this per this character was also not human. So I was sort of like, well, do they need to be a binary gender? And, and in Korean, you don't have to specify gender when you're talking um, okay. about a character. Mm -hmm. So and then but then I remember like not having enough context to make a decision because the story was still ongoing mm -hmm. and yeah, and so at that point, I had to sort of ask my editor and be like, "Huh, oh, you know, what do you think? Should I use they, them here?" And um, oh. yeah, and and so then they had to kind of do it back and forth with the author a little bit, and then they were like, "Well, this character is actually is male, so like, let's use he, him." So, oh, okay. um, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, uh, I guess what was the question? Sorry, I got off. Yeah, topic that's a okay. Bit. Yeah, no, you were not not off topic at all. So, <laughs> My question was about, um, well, now I have another question, but the mm -hmm. previous question was about localization. Oh, yeah, of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Have you faced any sort of, like, which audience are you translating for? Mm -hmm. Were there any sort of cultural things, like maybe, I don't know, food items or cultural practices that you really had to think about or not really because it's mm -hmm. sort of displayed in the image? You know, it's so different translating yeah. comics than, than, than um, you know, words just words on a page so yeah that's my first question yeah oh absolutely <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah yeah so um i think different publishers probably have different guidelines around this but legion uh i think favored um american english so in terms mm -hmm. of slang and um spelling and things like that like that was uh that was for that was in American English, uh -huh. um, and, and I think it could vary depending, um, you know, depending on publisher what their preference is. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of localization, uh, I worked on a, a fantasy, a historical fantasy webtoon, as well as a sci-fi um, fantasy webtoon, and so there were a lot of interesting localization choices that I was involved in making because there were terms that didn't exist even. Um, so there were like <laughs> made up terms in Korean that used like hanja, like Chinese characters to make up the word. And so I had to kind of decide like, do I do a transliteration here where I just kind of spell out what the Korean sound is in, in using Roman letters um, and then you know rely mm -hmm. on the readers um, having the context of the story to kind of figure out what that is or do I mm -hmm. take the meaning of the Chinese characters and then like kind of rewrite it in English um, so there were some decisions mm -hmm. that I worked on with an editor to kind of make sure I struck that balance of like let's not remove all elements of Koreanness from this story by yeah literally yeah like by translating some of the the, the terms um, but then let's you know, like for some of the other other things, let's make sure we keep let's let's just do a transliteration instead of a full localization. So, so it was a bit of like it was a mix. Like you were saying, for some of the names you did transliterate, and for some of the other ones you translated. Is that yeah, it? yeah, oh. yeah. So yeah, some concepts where we were like, you know, this is this probably makes more sense for the reader and the story if we just tran like localize and translate. And then there were some things that I think specifically related to Korean culture. We were like, let's not, um, you know, let's try to keep this um, in Korean, but just transliterate it and then make help the, you know, hopefully the, the story and the, the image kind of helps convey what that, what that is to the reader. So, um, yeah. And mm -hmm. so what's the sort of trend, like when, when I translate from Arabic, when I'm translating comics, the sort of trend mm -hmm. is that um, it ends up like whatever Arabic you have on the page, it ends up as more words in English, um, mm -hmm. just because Arabic is more sort of, I guess, you know, mm, for example, the verb to be is not in there, it's kind of implied. So as a mm -hmm. result, when you translate into English, you have to add things like is and am and, and whatever. But What's mm -hmm. the trend with Korean to English? Is it the same thing where you ha where you're having like the words come out as so much more, and then you have to try to condense it, or is it kind of on par? 
Yeah, yeah, I would say uh, things tend to be longer um, when you translate it into English. Uh, Korean is an agglutinative language. So like, you can say, you know, a whole sentence, English sentence worth of, of things um, using just one word and the right, like, kind of con- using the right, like, kind of um, uh, suffixes Whoa, uh, okay. attached to the <laughs> verb. Yeah. So like, <laughs> that was always interesting. And I was conscious of that when I would do my translation, because I knew the typesetter is going to have to like squeeze in all of my English, like into a word bubble. Yes. Um, but but I would, uh, but the publisher and my editors didn't have specific guidelines around that. They weren't like, you know, make sure you have only a certain number of characters. Um, but I was mindful of that because, you know, I don't want to, I, I didn't want to put the editors through too much extra work. So it's kind of like, okay, well, if the word bubble is this small, I probably shouldn't have like an entire paragraph in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And the process after you would submit your translation, is it a review? Would it be reviewed just by your editor, who I'm guessing speaks Korean and English? Or Mm -hmm. what what was the process before it would be sort of published online? Yeah, um, I didn't have a lot of involvement at all with that. Um, So I would, uh, I mean, I had deadlines for my chapters uh, weekly. And um, I was translating three titles. So I would have three separate deadlines that week. And wow, I would say, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> um, it wasn't huge. I would translate about like 400 to 800 words in English um, per okay. chapter per chapter. So like, no more than like 2400 words in a week. Um, it doesn't per- sound like a lot. But I know when you're working with pictures, it, there's a lot more to take into consideration, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, after I submitted the translation, um, you know, the, the editors told me in the beginning when I was starting out, they're like, well, you might have some back and forth or your editor might email you about something and you might have to make a tweak. Um, but I did not usually get any feedback afterwards. So I assumed either the changes they were making, and I would sort of see this in the in the final work, were mm-hmm. minor enough that they didn't feel like they needed to like communicate that to me, okay. um, and they just kind of like made the edit on um, you know as they were um, getting ready for the next step of the publication um, process, and didn't really inform me about it. So yeah, um, yeah. Didn't have a ton of transparency into the the steps <laughs> after um, after I submitted my translation, but okay. uh, for better or worse, <laughs> I don't know. And um, did you like? Why did you stop doing that? I mean, is it just because mm-hmm. you, you know something else came along, or are you still doing it? So I uh, was with Legion for about a little over a year, um, mm-hmm. and I stopped uh, mainly because. Um, well, one thing is like I started because I wanted the experience of translating webtoons because I, as a reader of webtoons, thought it would be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, (laughs) And um, also just like the regularity of doing translation because up until then it was sort of haphazard and I was kind of looking for opportunities. Mm -hmm. But um, I have a day job that's completely unrelated to translation. I work in tech Mm -hmm. um, and that's what pays my bills. Um, and, and so I was getting to a point with my translation where, uh, with, the, with the webtoon translation, where the benefit that I was getting out of um, translating webtoons was sort of decreasing. It was taking up a lot of time. Yeah. And I wanted to explore literary translation more. And I just didn't have um, as much time. I, that was around the time I also started working with Chogwa. I'm just going to um, ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. So Chogwa is, uh, was started by a um, Korean a translator, uh, Soje, um, and they are part of the, the Smoking Tigers uh, Korean Translators uh, Collective and um, known for their translations of uh, Korean poets. Um, and they started this project, uh, and it, it features one Korean poem every quarter, and invites multiple English translators, uh, English oh, translations. Okay. Yeah. And um, the whole, the chogwa in Korean means um, kind of excess. And, uh, and I think it's to, it's sort of the, the ethos of the, of the webzine is um, there shouldn't, uh, 
there's freedom in knowing that your translation isn't the only translation. Exactly. So you can kind of be more experimental. You don't have to be afraid as much. And that's, um, you know, that I, I started working with Chogwa as a contributor. I mean, I started contributing. That was my first poetry um, uh, translation ever. Mm -hmm. um, the first issue of Chogwa that I contributed to is my first ever tr um, poetry translation. And part of the reason I did it is because I didn't feel this fear that I needed to get everything right. Right. And I, I was going to have this opportunity to learn from other translators that also contributed uh, mm -hmm. contributed to it. So, yeah. So then I kind of um, chatted with Sojay and, and said, hey, you know, in my day job, I do a lot of like digital marketing. I do a lot of digital content. Like, mm -hmm. would you want someone to help with the sort of admin related stuff or social media related stuff um, mm -hmm. with with Chogwa and um, and so that's how I started working uh, working with them wow and so when you're submitting your translation like you don't see you don't discuss with the other translators right you no just kind of no submit mm -hmm. it blind and then you see afterwards like how everyone mm -hmm. has wow that's such a brilliant idea I, I mean you would think that other languages would be doing that I haven't I haven't come across that I'm aware of translation slams, but not like multiple translation slams. This feels mm -hmm. like the, yeah, like it's different. Uh, it, it just, it, it's so wonderful because Sojay as editor in chief um, often also provides really thoughtful commentary from their perspective on the submissions as well. Um, and so it's interesting seeing your work as part of this larger conversation um, around translating this particular poem and, um, and yeah, I don't know. I just, I feel like I've learned so much and grown so much as a translator just participating in, in Chogwa. Can you tell me a bit about the Hanok? Am I pronouncing that correctly? The Hanok Review? Hanok. Hanok. Yeah. Hanok. Yeah. Hanok Review um, is a upcoming literary review um, focused around poetry, um, but not just poetry and translation. They're also looking for poetry from uh, Korean um, poets from the Korean diaspora. Anyone that really has any connection to Korean culture mm -hmm. is welcome to submit um, their poetry. Um, but, but every issue uh, will have, um, will feature a poet and uh, the poet's work. So um, the first inaugural issue will be uh, I think we are aiming for the end of August, although it might bleed into the beginning of September. Um, mm -hmm. That's when uh, around the time it will be published. And we will be featuring the work of Yoon Hoon Young and, and translations of his poems. And yeah, I'm um, excited to be one of their staff translators. Um, so my role will, will be in providing reviews and comments to translations uh, that the other translators have provided and, and vice ah, versa. So okay. yeah, we're trying to make it more of a collaborative effort um, in, in translation and translating the, the poet, the poems. Ah, okay. And uh, just because I always think it's important, are you being paid for your work at the Hanok review and also at the web, at the juniors lab, <laughs> at the Chogwa? <laughs> <laughs> Chogwa and ha uh, no, the, so Chogwa and the Hanuk Review um, are volunteer uh, roles for me. Roles. Okay. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm not being paid. Um, the Webtoon uh, gig was paid. Right. Um, I was paid by Word, and um, yeah. So yeah, uh, and I, and I, you know, I, I say this with um, you know a lot of, of privilege in that because I I do have a day job and it's a tech job. Um, mm -hmm. There's I don't um, think about compensation, um, the, the, re the need for compensation um, too much. Although, you know, it would be nice to be paid for my labor, but I also yeah. think that, you know, I, I think as an as emerging translator, I'm grateful for the opportunity even to like talk to people in this space because I'm so far removed. Um, you know, I'm not in an MFA. I'm not in, and any kind of translator sort of circle other than the BIPOC one, which that has been great. Mm -hmm. um, so I, yeah. Um, so I think there's uh, benefits, but you know, I know that's not um, fair or um, 
uh, it's not a decision that uh, some people can make to yeah. do unpaid work. I, I mean, like, even when I was starting, I mean, I did a lot of unpaid work, but it's because I enjoyed it. Right. Mm -hmm, But at mm -hmm. the same time, I think like it does get to a point. I don't know. I think maybe eventually you'll get to a point where even with your day job, like you want to make sure that what you're doing, I don't know, is is doesn't have to be payment exactly, but is recognized and appreciated, which, you know, is probably how you do feel, which is, you know, why you're 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 taking part in these projects. Mm -hmm. Um, and you don't need an MFA to be a translator. Um, I don't have one. <laughs> um, and I'm not planning. I mean, I, sometimes I'm tempted and I'm like, oh, it looks so cool. But like, where am I going? I don't have time for that. Like, I'm sorry. No. Um, so <laughs> um, I wanted, I mean, you obviously have a lot going on, but I wanted to ask, is there anything you're like pitching at the moment or something or, or like a book that you've read that you're just in love with and hoping that some publisher out there who's listening? There is one. Um, there's a, there's a short story that I'm translating. Um, it's a science fiction short story by a relatively new author Um, and it's a story that I just happened to stumble across when I was reading a collection on, um, science, on science fiction, Korean science fiction. And, um, this one, this story won an award for, um, I think it was like new writers. I I don't know. I have to, let's just cut that. I don't know the name of it. It's okay. It's it's an an award award. winning. Yeah. Yeah. It won an award. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, and um, it's it's very like Black Mirror esque. Like it has to. Uh, I don't know if you've seen the show Black Mirror, but I haven't um, watched it, but I'm aware of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's very um, kind of about like um, virtual reality and and um, but uh, but yeah, it's a really great story. And um, the author really uh, the author's life actually really resonated with me because they. Mm. Um, the author uh, actually wanted to be a writer. Couldn't um, said that she she had some challenges trying to make it as a writer. So then um, mm-hmm. is now working in IT with or started working in, in IT, mm-hmm. and um, <clears throat> but they're also fluent in Japanese. And I was like, wow, there's so many things, like so many threads coming together here. I feel yeah. like such a resonance with this writer. So I am translating that and, and hoping to pitch and or submit it to some places, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, but I'm, I'm kind of taking my time with it. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of uh, what's on my mind. <laughs> okay, great. There's so much more I want to ask you, but I'm also aware like, you know, we can't sit here forever. Um but I just wanted to, yeah, thank you again for, you know, joining me today. And thank you to our listeners. And do you want to maybe give your Twitter, are your, your, are your Twitter handle in case anybody wants to sort of yeah, reach out yeah. to you? Yeah. Do you want to just like, mm-hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I am at, uh, yeah, I am at Chanamu on um, Twitter. That's C-H-A-N-A-M-U-U. Um, and, uh, yeah, the, the reason for that name is like another story, but, <laughs> but yes, you can find me on Twitter there. Okay. Great. Yeah, and I'm yeah. very active on there. So thank you so much for having me. This is, a, this is so delightful. And my first ever like conversation about translation anywhere. So this is super exciting for me. <laughs> well, I hope it's the beginning of many more. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for listening and many thanks to Archana and Sawad for that brilliant conversation. If you have any questions about this episode or anything else we do, you can find us all over the internet. We are on Twitter and Instagram at Writers Centre. We have a Facebook page and of course we have a website which is found at nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk. If you go over there, you can find out about everything that's coming up, all of our courses that you can sign up to right now, and of course, join our newsletter so that you don't miss anything that's coming up later this year. And there is a lot. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss future episodes. Please do leave us a review and a rating if you get a chance. And thanks again. Keep writing and we will catch you on the next episode.